Pleasure to have Dan Needleman from Harvard and Flatiron Institute talking today. He's going to be doing both the first half of the talk and the second half. Um, the and um, uh, the the general for those of you who are coming in for the first time, uh, we ask you uh, to please keep yourself uh, muted and please ask the questions in the chat. We will ask them on your behalf in the question time. But we do ask you, if you can, to stay on after the hour, and then we will ask you to unmute yourself, and we can have an informal discussion where you can uh, interact more directly and follow up on the questions you asked. So, uh, Dan, uh, thanks for speaking, and take it away. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And so, uh, no, it's a real pleasure to be able to, um, I don't know, give this online presentation. So so my understanding of my assignment was was that my first part is, is kind of a very... Um, uh, broad, low-level kind of intro, and the second part is kind of a research talk. So I see there's some real, um, you know, experts here on cytoskeleton. So I apologize in advance uh, uh, for the first part. Uh, we'll be very, very uh, low introductory level, but uh, after that, then, then hopefully, you know, there'll be um, if you can stay around. Hopefully, stuff that you'll find interesting. Um, okay, so then I'll I'll just get going. All right, so active matter, microtubules, and cell division. All right, so so just for people who aren't familiar with me, so my um, um, training is both uh, an undergrad and uh, grad student or in physics. Uh, and then uh, for a postdoc, I switched to a cell biology lab to Mitchison's lab. Um, and now I've had my own lab, which is trying to combine uh, physics and uh, cell biology to understand um, uh, biology <laughs> in particular. <laughs> like what I've been interested in for a very long time, actually, ever since I got into science, um, is biological self-organization. And so by that, what I mean is I want to have a quantitative understanding of biological processes, um, including how molecules self-organize into subcellular structures and cells, and how cells sort of organize into tissues and organisms. And I want to understand how these are uh, processes are perturbed in disease and change over evolution. Now, of course, these are incredibly uh, complicated, difficult problems, and there are many ways that one could study them. Uh, for me personally, the the type of approach which I find most uh, personally satisfying is to try to um, tackle these issues by doing very quantitative experiments that are a form that one can compare uh, to some type of theory and simulation and therefore gain insight. Uh, it's often the case that the things that uh, my lab's interested in uh, measuring, we don't currently have tools for, and therefore we do a lot of technique development as well. Uh, but this is like super big picture. All right, so with that, I'll go into like kind of part one. Um, and so, like I said, so for me, um, biological self-organization is the main um, motivation. Um, and um, active matter physics uh, is what I would say is the physics of biological self-organization. All right, so what do I mean by that? So, um, you know, living systems are clearly uh, out of equilibrium, um, but there are many different ways of being out of equilibrium. So one way you can be out of equilibrium is that you can prepare a system in some non-equilibrium state and then have it relax without energy input. Uh, and so, for example, maybe you make a solution of proteins um, and you put it on the shelf and then over time it crystallizes. That relaxation of you know going from soluble proteins to a crystal is a non-equilibrium process, but it occurs without energy input. That's one way of being out of equilibrium. Another way of being out of equilibrium is that you can input energy to a sample um, uh, from the boundaries. And so a classic example of this is if you have a fluid and you, for example, heat it from the bottom and cool it from the top, then you get these so-called convection rolls. Uh, and you can get very complicated uh, patterns by driving samples um, out of equilibrium in, in this type of manner. But here you really have a material which is, um, you know, just a material and it's being driven out of equilibrium by energy input at its boundaries. The third way to be, uh, or a third way to be out of equilibrium um, is to actually have energy input at the microscopic scale. Uh, and this is what we mean by active matter. Uh, so active matter, you could say, is um, matter and where the individual constituents transduce energy and violate detailed balance. So, um, so uh, uh, and you can think of active matter as being essentially the, the behaviors of um, 
uh, act to better really result from this kind of collective properties of molecules that, that violate detail bounds individually. So, so what do I mean by that? I mean that, so like if you're in a system in equilibrium, um, then you obey detail balance. And so what that means is, so for example, if you have three different states, your molecules can be in A, B, and C, then, then the uh, rate that you go from A to C to B back to A has to equal the rate that you go from A to B to C back to A. <laughs> uh, and so, for example, if you imagine some receptor that can bind some ligands and that can cause it to open or in the receptor can close, again, the transitions kind of back and forth between these um, um, uh, must be equal, must satisfy detailed balance. On the other hand, for many, uh, in many biological systems, um, you're driven out of equilibrium at the uh, molecular level due to the molecules um, essentially uh, catalyzing some chemical reaction where the components of that reaction are held out of equilibrium by the cell's metabolism. And, and, and because of that, you can have polymers in which, for example, maybe they bind GTP and GDP, and, and they can assemble if they bind GTP, like microtubules we'll talk about more later, hydrolyze and disassemble, and that can cause essentially nearly one-way flows, um, which violate detail balance. Or alternatively, if you have a molecular motor, which can bind a filament and then walk on it by hydrolyzing ATP and then unbind, again, this is a cycle which violates detail balance. And so active matter is essentially um, matter made from molecules like that, that transduce energy and uh, violate detailed balance. And there are examples of this which span vastly different length scales, and such active materials can display complex, often counterintuitive behaviors. Uh, for example, you can have uh, particles which violate detailed balance and, un and then undergo uh, coherent motions. Um, and so here we have some self-propelled particles which spontaneously break symmetry and just go in one direction. You can also have uh, unusual phenomena uh, such as so-called active jamming where you have motile particles which um, can drive themselves to high density states where they stop moving. And so again, you know, like this is what we want to call active jamming. So very non-trivial counterintuitive um, uh, behaviors uh, due to active matter. All right, so that was active matter at a more macroscopic scale. But uh, nearly all cell biological structures and processes one could think of as being active matter or are active matter. Uh, one way I like to think about this is related to a quote from uh, Leibniz uh, a long time ago. He says, I define the organism or natural machine, uh, a machine in which each part is a machine, whereas the parts of our artificial machines are not machines. And so active matter you can think of, of as being machines made of machines. All right. So, um, and one, like I said, there are many cell biological examples of it, nearly everything, uh, honestly, but one, uh, one uh, strong example is the cytoskeleton. And so, for example, um, um, cytoskeleton has many uh, components, one of the which are microtubules, and you have molecular motors, which by hydrolyzing ATP can exert forces on microtubules and, and cause them to move. Um, and then this, and then this kind of microtubule and molecular motors are an example where you have many of them working together can self-organize into very uh, complicated uh, um, uh, behaviors. Uh, and so, in fact, the self-organization of microtubules and molecular motors underlie diverse cell biological processes. Um, here's one example, which is cytoplasmic streaming in, in Drosophila oocytes, where um, due to uh, the interaction of microtubules and molecular motors, it drives large scale fluid flows uh, uh, in the oocytes, which some people believe are might be important for uh, mixing the oocytes or, or in localizing certain molecules inside them. Another example of self-organization of microtubules and molecular mo motors is uh, um, in neurons. Uh, and so the you know, neurons have these very long processes, axons and dendrites. A lot of the formation of them is due to the self-organization of microtubules and molecular motors. Um, and um, uh, another example are, are uh, mitotic and meiotic spindles, which uh, uh, divide chromosomes during uh, cell division. Um, so, um, and, and, and there are many more. So 
my lab for 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 a while has has worked on um, uh, spindles, and, and actually, I'm going to talk more about it today. And, and that's a lot of what we've done. Actually, now we're starting to also do stuff on uh, neurons, but we're just just starting that. All right, so so I'll dive into more details on spindles. Okay, so like I said, spindles are primarily composed of microtubules, and um, our microtubules are in turn again composed of the protein tubulin. So some spindles can actually contain a uh, huge number of microtubules, uh, 100,000 microtubules, you know, so 100,000 of these polymers. Um, and uh, one thing which is important to keep in mind is that if you look at a textbook um, a picture of a spindle, it'll often show something like the following, which, which will um, kind of implies that um, uh, all the microtubules have one end, so-called the minus end at the pole, and the other end, so-called the plus end in, near the center, and that there's a sharp distribution of lengths of, of microtubules. Um, we, we, we know that now uh, for many spindles and many organisms, particularly um, in um, uh, metazoans and uh, uh, animals, uh, a, a more faithful cartoon would be something like the following, uh, uh, which is supposed to show you that the minus ends and plus ends of microtubules are in fact spread out through, throughout the spindle and, there's, and they have a very broad distribution of lengths. And so it's like you have these kind of sea of little microtubules as a way to think about the uh, spindle. All right, so microtubule polymerization dynamics um, are an active process that use energy. All right, so one can study this in the spindle, in in um, uh, neurons, and you know, in cells directly, or one can study this in vitro. So, for example, this is um, uh, an example of someone uh, making a kind of a nucleating site and just directly visualizing individual microtubules growing and shrinking, um, and then. If one does that and you look at them and just you know um, uh, look at their length as a function of time, uh, you can see that um, uh, they they undergo this uh, very interesting uh, growing and shrinking dynamic. It's called uh, uh, dynamic instability, in which um, you can have states where the microtubule just gets in a growing state for a very long period of time. So here it's grown for ten microns, this individual filament, and that's added. You know, so one micron of microtubules is roughly 1,500 uh, tubule and subunits. So here you've added, you know, over 10,000 tubule and subunits, and then sting happens, and then it, that shrinks. Um, um, and um, uh, this this uh, switching from uh, growing to uh, shrinking is called a catastrophe. And then the the filament can now uh, sometimes can switch from um, uh, shrink to growing, a so-called rescue. Um, yeah, and as I said, this process is called dynamic instability, and um, the, the the basic idea, uh, which um, uh, people have in their heads uh, or people believe um, happens or what drives this, is the fact that uh, growing and shrinking is coupled to the hydrolysis of uh, GTP. So you can have tubulin subunits in solution, which bind GDP, then that can get exchanged for GTP. When they have GTP, they basically want to uh, assemble into the filament, and so that drives them into the filament. Um, and then inside, when they're inside the microtubule, the GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP, and they are no longer happy being in the filament, such that if you lose this kind of cap of GTP on the end, the whole th the microtubule can catastrophically disassemble. Um, and... Um, 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 one one idea which has been around for a while is that the kind of GTP, even though we know now that things are a little bit more complicated than this, is that the GTP uh, uh, subunit is kind of straight, so it wants to be in the filament, while the GDP one is more curved, so it would prefer to be outside. And actually, uh, despite a lot of uh, fantastic work from from a lot of people, this this process is still um, um, uh, not not uh, uh, completely understood. Okay. In addition to the growing and shrinking using energy, like I said, the, there are also molecular motors, which are very important for the spindle and for uh, many other you know, complex self-organization of, of microtubules. Um, so you can have kinesin um, uh, is one type of motor. And in fact, it's known that there are uh, 14 different family of kinesins, which play roles in spindles, so a very large number. And there's also dynein. And, and, and these uh, molecular motors, uh, you know, hydrolyze ATP and use that to walk along the microtubules. And 
they can transport, they can use to transport cargo along the microtubules. So kinesin carrying a cargo to the plus end of the filament, dynein carrying a cargo for the minus end, for example, which is believed to be important in, in uh, transporting cargo in neurons and in, in, in many other contexts. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, including in, in the spindle, uh, the, the cargo, which a motor carries, is another microtubule. Um, and uh, this is very important in the spindle and, and also uh, very important in uh, neurons. And so one clear uh, demonstration of this importance in the spindle is the following, is that if you look at kind of the structure of a kind of normal spindle, it's a bipolar structure, you know, so you have the two poles, you know, chromosomes would be in the middle. And then if you inhibit a single molecular motor called kinesin 5, the spindle reorganizes and becomes this aster-like structure. And if you inhibit another molecular motor called dynein, or, you know, which I mentioned before, the spindle is in a barrel-shaped structure. And if one simultaneously inhibits both kinesin 5 and dynein, then you get a structure that looks pretty much, you know, bipolar structure, pretty much like the control one. Um, and so, you know, the question is how to understand this and other types of self-organization of microtubules. Now, a, a very important thing to realize is that in the spindle, and again, many other cell biological uh, contexts, um, the microtubules which make up the structure, make up the spindle, are highly dynamic, even when the spindle itself can exist at steady state for a long time. So here, this is an experiment, which actually I did as a postdoc, but other people have done you know, similar things for quite a long time. Uh, in this particular experiment, what I did was um, label about one in 100,000 microtubules in the spindle so that uh, every dot you see here is a single tubulin micro, uh, it's a single tubulin monomer that's incorporated in a microtubule in the spindle. And the spindle is here sitting at steady state with the chromosomes in the middle and the two poles here. And what you see is that every single molecule is, is moving. And so even though the structure is at steady state, maintaining a constant size and length, you have this continual flux of tubulin uh, from the chromosomes to the poles, everything sliding, and the microtubules are constantly growing and shrinking. So this, the spindle is like this kind of sea of short microtubules, which are constantly sliding, constantly growing and shrinking, yet maintaining a steady state structure. Um, and spindles are true self-organizing structures. There's many ways that you can see that. Um, but one of my favorite illustrations is just an experimental system that, that I and, and many other people have used, and that's frog egg extracts. So if you take a frog and you um, inject it with hormones, that makes it lay a bunch of eggs. Each of these eggs has a little spindle in it, um, and it's arrested um, in metaphase with a little spindle sitting there waiting to be fertilized. And then what you can do is that you can just centrifuge these and crush um, uh, all the eggs. And then you have this kind of um, layer, which is essentially undiluted cytoplasm. And actually, when you do the centrifugation, you um, actually pellet the DNA itself. And so this has all the components of the cytoplasm, but there's no DNA. And actually, there's no spindles here. Nonetheless, it contains all the components necessary for spindle assembly besides DNA. And, and uh, the evidence for that is, is that, well, like I said, there's normally no spindle in there, but if you simply just add DNA to the extract, it will spontaneously assemble a spindle that is the same size and shape as the spindle that's um, in the uh, uh, eggs themselves. And in fact, uh, it's been on for a long time. So uh, Rebecca Heal did experiments uh, in the 90s where she actually took um, uh, magnetic beads coated with lambda phage DNA threw them in these extracts, and they made spindles, again, same size and shape as those in the um, egg itself. So even the sequence of the DNA doesn't matter for, for, for many things, but matters for other things, of course. All right, and again, this is uh, another illustration of the spindle really being self-organizing, and, and that is the following. So in these extracts, uh, you can, and you throw in DNA, you can have multiple spindles just kind of floating around. And um, uh, one thing which, you know, a number of years ago, Jay Gatlin did, and other people have done similar things, is that take two spindles and push them together in this extract, and then they fuse and form one spindle, which to a first approximation is the same size and shape as, as uh, either the original two. So again, really a self-organizing system. All right. So now the big question is, you know, 
So I said spindles are essentially microtools and molecular motors, but how does it happen? How do microtools and molecular motors organize into the spindle? But they also organize into neurons. They also organize into these you know, bundles that drive cytoplasmic flow. So what determines what structure you know, they self-organize into? All right. Um, in other words, how does the architecture and dynamics of these cell biological structures arise from the behavior of microtubules and motors and what determines what one gets, right? You know, um, uh, And then how to understand this um, uh, more generally. Now, one type of approach that one can take, which is the main, okay, is that one could try to address this by uh, studying spindles, neurons, and you know, oocyte flows and other things directly. And actually that's the main thing that my lab does. Um, but another approach one can take is to try to have more simplified systems where one purifies microtubules and motors and mix them together and then see if it one sees and tries to understand self-organization in vitro. And many people, of course, have done have done that as well. Um, and uh, my group has done a little bit of, in, in that regard, too. And I'll just mention a little bit of, of efforts that people have done for doing that. And so it's pretty amazing that if you one just simply takes uh, molecular motors and and microtubules and mixes them up once you can see all sorts of things. And so, for example, there's kind of classic work by um, uh, Nettle um, uh Stan Leibler, and um, um, Parsenti, where they um, um, uh, made artificial clusters, threw them in with stabilized microtubules and saw uh, all sorts of interesting things. And, and many people have expanded on that. And so, for example, uh, uh, one work from a uh, series group, and I believe with Nedlock as well, they made artificial clusters, mixed them with stabilized microtubules. And uh, uh, like I said, this is the original paper from uh, one of the original papers from uh, 2001, where under some conditions, just mixing up these, uh, one sees spontaneously asters form in different aster structures with different motors. And depending on the concentration of components, uh, they saw a whole zoo of shapes that one could get from asters to bundles to, I'm not sure what this is, kind of cool swirly things. Um, now, despite this being so done, Dan, you have never- Dan, yeah. you have three minutes for the first oh. talk. Yeah. Okay, 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 excellent. I will say, despite this being done over um, uh, 20 years ago, um, you know, this is still, I would say, poorly understood. Uh, and besides many, uh, many fantastic work from many, many people following up on, on this. And, and, and uh, but, but, but really understanding what patterns form when and why, what's the dynamic and pathway of self-organization, what's actually the detailed structure of asters or even bundles, so I'd say we don't know. Um, and for example, one just very basic questions are after are esters ever really stable or do they always just want to fuse and form larger structures? Just very, very basic questions we still don't know the answer to. Um, I'll just say uh, 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 one thing very quickly, uh, and that is that, and so um, additional work by uh, Zonar Dojek has really taken this in a very interesting direction where he took these same clusters and just added an inert polymer peg um, um, with the microtubules, and that just makes the microtubules want to bundle with each other, as well as having forces for motors. Um, and when he does that, he sees these structures spontaneously, um, you know, make bundles, which induce large-scale flows, which are at least reminiscent of aspects of what one sees in Drosophila um, oocytes, even though in detail, of course, it's quite different. Um, and um, uh, if he puts these on a surface, um, he sees that they spontaneously align and make very dense pneumatics, um, uh, you know, aligned phases, which um, uh, spontaneously flow. And, um, you know, so really beautiful. And, and, and this, you know, can exhibit, uh, go on for hours. Uh, and then uh, one thing I'll just say very briefly is that um, uh, many people have uh, tried to compose kind of uh, continuum theories uh, to uh, explain this. And one can see qualitative agreement, um, but I would argue that a lot of this is still very poorly understood, but despite a lot of fantastic work for many people. Um, and it's still unclear to what extent one can really get quantitative agreement, really have predictive theories of these um, uh, uh, structures. All right, so that, with that, I'll end my part one. Great, thanks, Dan. Uh...
for a beautiful talk. So we have a we have a few questions already. Let me uh, let me just start with uh, Isaac's question. Uh, he's asking in this one D picture of transport along a microtubule, how are cargo kept clear from each other to prevent unintentional collisions? Is that even a concern? Oh, I think that's a phenomenal question. Okay, the short answer is I don't know, and I don't know if I think. Um, I'm not, you know, definitely people have thought about that and I don't know the, you know, all the details, but I think in general, it's not well understood. It's pretty amazing. If you look at an EM image of a uh, axon, um, it's really like full of microtubules. Uh, and so looking at those images, one would certainly think that kind of, you know, issues with, uh, uh, cargo, um, interference could be important. But, uh, as far as I understand, that's quite poorly understood still. Uh, so Jing Chen has a question on uh, MT instability. About MT instability dynamics, the catastrophe rate is often modeled as dependent on the MT length. Of course, MT length is related to the time that the microtubule has stayed in the growing state. Is it known as if the catastrophe rate actually depends on the length or the age of the growing microtubule? For example, what is observed at the growing speed is tuned in a certain way. Okay, so that's, a, again, a fantastic question, and I would defer to other people who know more about this than me, more expertly, Joe Howard is here, and, and I would I would suggest asking him. <laughs> I don't know the precise answer to that. Uh, Maybe yeah. we can come back to that in the discussion, but in fact, I was going to ask a related question, which is, what is now, um, sort of, if there is a consensus view, what is the consensus view on how in dynamic instability happens? Because I remember... They, there was a whole host of theories uh, which have been proposed over the last 10 years or so, right? In various kinds of topological theories, things to do with unpeeling the 13 tubulin fibers and, uh, right? So is it, yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah, so, so um, okay. So, so again, my understanding, I'm certainly not an expert on the details of this, but my understanding is again, in detail, this is still not well understood. Um, and certainly not a, a real kind of molecular kind of structural level. You know, I believe that uh, there are a number of, like you said, kind of more coarse grain uh, uh, theories, which which um, uh, can explain a lot of the trends which people observe. Again, like a call it Joe Howard one more time, um, um, uh, who's done a lot of work on that. But but um, yeah yeah. So there's a question by uh, uh, Guillaume, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, could you clarify why the addition of DNA results in the formation of spindles? Yeah, so that's, again, fantastic question. So so people have done a lot of work on that. The, the very short uh, 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 version of the answer to that is that uh, there are molecules in solution which bind the DNA. And upon binding the DNA, they can then activate a signaling pathway, the RAND pathway, um, which then can uh, induce the assembly of microtubules and induces it kind of locally around the spindle. And then and then those microtubules can get self-organized by molecular motors and that gives you the spindle. Uh, okay, and there's another question from Abigail. Uh, are the different motifs formed by microtubules when inhibiting different motors linked to the shape of the motors or is it only due to the forces exerted by the different motors? Yeah, that's a really fantastic question um so so one thing which is clear is that even if you have the same motor and you just simply vary the concentration of the motor and the microtubules that that you have and that's all you have microbes motors you can see drastically different shapes forming mm -hmm. um and so uh and, and why that is and you know that's not well understood um but also like you know when okay when i and other people draw cartoons of this like i'll just go to this cartoon um yeah, here's a cartoon which um, uh, Zonimer Dojuk's group drew, where they drew these kind of motors sitting between the microtubules and cross looking like this. We don't even know if that's correct, basically. You know, we don't even know the confirmation of the motors when they're cross looking microtubules. Do, are they really sitting in between the filaments like this? Is it sitting more complicated? And if one tries to make kind of microscopic theories of how these processes work and what are the resulting forces that form, it really does depend on these details, which we just don't know the answer to. So maybe I could just ask a follow-up, which is that, uh, is there a significant difference between say peg-induced bundling and motor-induced bundling in terms of the macroscopic structures formed? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so, and so, um, it is certainly possible to get similar self-organized structures by varying whether you have cross-linking due to peg or, or a passive cross-linker 
uh, in both of those chromosomes motors or just motors at a high enough concentration where they induce cross-linking, it is possible to get similar structures from these very different pathways. On the other hand, you know, with one component, it's also possible to get many different structures. And so, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, I think maybe we should just get started on the second uh, second part of your talk.